Thank you. Thank you. I was uh, talking to someone about anxiety about talking to you, and um, they said, remember, the audience loves you. <laughs> I'll try and remember that. For those of you in the AGM who heard uh, Gary's sort of forensic presentation, and those of you who know me, I talk and lecture a bit differently. The invitation is to let it wash over you. What sticks and you remember is worth remembering. What doesn't is just for froth. So I want to start with a thanks. Uh, thanks for two things, really, for this uh, prestigious invitation and the invitation to spend the last three or four weeks of my life anxious as hell. <laughs> <laughs> But on the way up here, I managed to, as I often managed to do, I stop in and see a gallery, and I popped in at the uh, National Portrait Gallery. Um, and uh, it was fantastic. Um, I walked in there, and I saw the pictures that I've been seeing many, many times of the great classics, but I saw them differently. And I saw them differently because of this talk. And what was different is I looked at the people represented from the ages, and I realized they are exactly the same as the people I see in front of me and the patients I see. They haven't changed. And I've never really, it's never landed on me quite like that, that they're the same people. You know, illnesses and the patterns of illnesses, they may come in different guises, but they don't fundamentally change. So our legacy, our 200-year legacy as a healing art, I think is as profound now as it's ever been. But things do change. Now, the Impressionists, when they started, they had first eight Impressionist exhibitions. They were considered a very fringe alternative event. <laughs> no one thought that would catch on. And it was because they were start painting with little tiny dots of color. And actually, when you stood back and looked at it, they painted a different picture. And not only did they paint a different picture, but the picture was different. The picture revealed emotion. Now, not everyone who looks at the same picture gets the same feeling. But the feelings you get are reliable. Now, I spent 20 years of my, first, of my professional life, and I've been working. I met Brian Kaplan here, and Etienne Cowlett, but was on the long, what was called then the long course in 1982. I'd just finished my uh, medical training and house jobs. And I spent the first 20 years just consolidating the laws of cure. It was my second year at medical school where I read the Organon. And it touched me profoundly. It was the first time. You know, this is a young, impressionable lad who'd been taught that the secret of health was in the bodies I was dissecting, the chemical formulas that were being put up on the board, and the histology I was looking down the microscope. And it didn't meet my heart. I come from a medical family, but I didn't meet my heart. When I read the Organon, it touched me. So 20 years it took me. First week in practice, I decided to go into independent practice. I saw three patients. It's got busier since then. <laughs> But it was a delight to read and study and learn from my patients. So I want to, standing on the shoulders of the great teachers that Richard Hughes represents and others amongst them and the colleagues here, I want to thank my patients. You know, I'm at that stage in the career where I'm starting to look more at the sailing weather than the patient list. But my patients have taught me a great deal. And over that 20 years, I realized that actually what I was reading in the books and what I'd been taught in the courses in homeopathy wasn't enough. It wasn't enough by far. Actually, it was a lot more to what we do. And I want to share some of the thoughts that I have and some of the principles that I've worked to because they've steered me and developed over the time. And I'm not sure they work for me now. And I have to believe that there perhaps there's a germ in them that will help you and serve you as you look forward and move forward. I think we have got a solid foundation. It is a firm road, but you have to move on. You have to move on. You know, homeopathy was described in the days of the classical painters. You know, it is a different world now. I arrived here, I've been here once before for a talk, and I remembered the great gallery opposite, and I saw the Francis Bacon exhibition was on, and a friend was talking about it, I went and saw that. Now, that is another jump in the artistic world. We're bringing us up to more contemporary times. But compare that with the Constables and the Turners, or even the Picassos or the Monets. You know, it's a different art form. It has moved on. And if nothing else, we practice the healing art. We must move on. We must create new remedies. We must create new pictures. We must create new ways of working. 
We have to adapt to this changing world. It's a very different world to the ones that I've started to train in, or historically when Hanneman was practicing and formulated his great ideas. So the first thought when Trish, on behalf of the faculty, asked me to give this talk was, who's cancelled? <laughs> <laughs> the second talk was, it reminded me that a week before I'd been talking in supervision about winding down my practice and what are the unfinished conversations. And I've written several unfinished conversations to patients on the website at the Natural Practice with Trish and Katia I work with, I'd like to work with, where I talked about various things. I talked about how often I felt I needed to apologize to my patients about the medical profession, how they've been treated. I talked about the origins of abuse and neglect and the emotional triggers for chronic disease. The most significant contributing factor to chronic disease that I think is currently hugely unrecognized. Not a coincidence that these artists I talked about, the Impressionists and Bacon, are all renowned for the ability to communicate feeling. And medical science Conventional medical science has got very little language around feelings, very little tools for it. You might not agree with me on that, but I see people time and time again, they give a history of abuse, neglect, trauma in relationships that deeply sit as a causative factor and a relational factor. And not only that, they mirror those back because we know that what happens to a person inside is how they want to prove themselves on the environment. You know, when someone comes in and we pick up a remedy state from them, that remedy, the patient is proving themselves on us. They create a Nux vomica patient is perfectly happy if they live in a Nux vomica world. You live in a Nux vomica world and you become a Nux vomica patient. You know, they're related, the inner and outer, the microcosm and the macrocosm are related. So when we practice the healing art, and when people step into a healthy state, they start to address the balances in the world around them. They address the relationships they're in, the emotional relationships, the sustainability of the environment, the care for others. This is what we're talking about, not just Mrs. Jones in front of us who's had this pain or that pain. I appreciate it's a grandiose gesture, but I think it's time we stood up as a community and said, there's a public health face to what we do that the diseases that people suffer and we suffer in our world, the huge growth in autoimmune disease, the bacterial resistance to antibiotics, you know, this is important stuff that we need to get much wider knowledge about. So this recognition that I've been talking about, the need to complete or say something to my professional colleagues as a part of ending my career, came just before this invitation. And I recognize this synchronicity in my life is important. It's probably one of the guiding principles that I choose not to live or not to believe that I live in a random universe. It's a problem when all the medical research is based on randomized control studies. I wouldn't want to be in a study where half my patients are allocated placebo. I, I, I wouldn't be present in the same way. These aren't the studies I think that are going to prove or not whether what we have has impact. What I want to look at is my patients who've been family patients, whose children I've treated, whose children's children have come to me. Now, are those families healthier? Do they suffer less pain? Do they have more emotional integrity? Do they have a higher sense of well-being? I don't know. Obviously, I feel and I believe they do. But that's what I'm really interested in. What about those people that we can become and help become better and weller? So I talked about talking to a colleague about my anxiety. So one, the first Richard Hughes Memorial Lecture I gave was titled The Power of Process. It was a long time ago because it was on those flippy plastics that you put on an overhead projector. <laughs> and why The Power of Process? Because I was convinced at that point, it was emerging about 20 years ago, that the importance of transference and counter was what was unsaid in the consultation, what was enacted, what was projected onto me, had some uh, information and value to me. It developed the idea of projective identification, the idea that when the two people buy into a concept, it becomes almost solid. And I want you to think about our energetic remedies and how they relate to the material world. 
because they're not, I don't think they have to be material in their own right. We know that sensation, function, and structure are related. They impact on each other. When I was thinking, someone said, you usually do something quite provocative, and I thought, I might bring up a bit of dog poo and get you to prove it and dilute it down and see how you feel taking it. Because there's nothing in it. How dilute would it have to be before you put your finger in it and licked it? <laughs> or if I asked you to visualise some bright sunlight and a beautiful sunny day and a stream tinkling in the background, as long as you're not frightened of water, you'd have a very different feeling. And if you lived in that feeling long enough, it would have a functional physiological effect. And if you lived in that physiological effect long enough, it would have a structural effect. And this is what we have to deal with in terms of the complex cases, the chronic diseases, that we can do so much to help. So the anxiety I was picking up on relates to a principle of what's called parallel process. And that's what we feel inside is actually a reflected into and a reflection of what's outside. The inside and outside reflect each other. So I have to accept that this high-level anxiety is something to do with me, but I might be picking up an anxiety on you. And I heard, you know, you know it is great to treasure and, and honour the brand of homeopathy, but we also have to see its faults as well. I've been through two rebrandings of the faculty, <laughs> both unsuccessful. We're back to the old logos. <laughs> It needs something a bit more than that. I think it's a different journey. So what are the challenges we face? So when I see a patient with an illness, I say to them something along the lines of, why has this illness come to you now? What's your body trying to tell you? And I have to say the same to us as a community. What are the symptoms? What are the illnesses? What are the tensions? Now, I, over the years, have become a little bit ashamed of calling myself a homeopath. 20 years I spent building the brand and my profession around being a homeopathic physician. I now go out to a party and people ask me what I do and I say holistic physician, integrative physician. It's that people don't get it. When you say homeopathy, you know, you knew the writing on the wall when you were told that joke about oh, homeopaths, they're sort of cross between psychopaths and mad axe killers. You know, it might rehabilitate. And it doesn't mean we have to leave the language behind. But actually, when I talk to patients, like treating life and ultra-high dilutions aren't part of what I talk about. So what are the challenges we face? Before I do that, I want to say another truism. And I don't say this so often to patients, but I do with the teams that I work to. So I'm lucky enough, for the last few years, I've been working two weeks on, two weeks off, as a sort of phased retirement. And in my two weeks on, I tend to do three days practice and two days coaching and team development, which is mostly in the health profession now, GP practices, some hospital co uh, consultants. And one of the things I say, and one of the things that guide me, is that the wounds that hurt most become the battle scars I'm most proud of. We've all got those wounds. Some of you are living in them now. And they will become the battle scars that you can say, I got this one going to try and meet the GMC. <laughs> I got this one talking at this meeting here. So at this point, again, I should just issue a general disclaimer that, of course, you know, I don't know the future. I might have looked in my own crystal ball, whatever it, you conceptualize that of, and it might be faulty. <laughs> it might not be the one that serves you. So I, there's no hard and fast truth, but I've tried to extrapolate from the trends that I've seen and, touched on, and will touch on some of the phrases and ideas that have helped me navigate those. So one of the phrases I use a lot of in my practice is, I don't treat conditions, I don't treat diseases, I treat people. We don't get rid of illness. I help people get rid of their illness. I coach them alongside. I work with them. It's a really important contractual difference that not all of us might choose to work that way, but for me, it allows me to be present. It allows me not to take the responsibility away from the patient. It's at the center of the contract, often implicit, but sometimes explicit, I have with patients. I think if, if that could come across in, in a wider acceptance in medicine, 
it would fundamentally shift how people relate to the contract they have with their healthcare providers. It doesn't suit every situation. I have a car crash on the way home. I'm going to want an orthopedic surgeon to do stuff to me. But if I have chronic disease, or I have those early acutes, the recurrent acutes that we know so well are a precursor or a rider for more under, deep undersiding, uh, uh, deep-seated conditions, you know, I need to know what is my body telling me? What do I need to do to get better? I don't want another person to do it for me, because when it comes around again, I don't haven't learned how to do it. We all know the patients with the current urinary tract infections. The antibiotics are great. They kill it, kill it off straight away. But how many reoccur within a month? So I don't aim to make you better. But I'll do my absolute best to help you make yourself better. I don't have an answer about what the future's going and what our position should be, but maybe I can help you shape the questions that we should be asking. So what I can ask patients in getting to think about is what do we need to change so I don't need the illness? What do we need to change so we don't need the pain? What's the opportunities for growth? Or, I wonder what beliefs we hold that no longer serve us. And what do we know or believe in or value but we're not fully utilising or articulating? That to me seems like the important thing. How do we manifest our creative influence? Our power. How do we be present, as fully present as possible? So usually when I talk, I have slides because I don't really want people to look at me because, again, it sort of just diverts, doesn't it? But I'm aware, you know, I need, we need to be here. You know, this is a relational thing. The art of medicine is relational. You know, we need to have that presence, that sense that we work with. And I think there's a crying demand for that. You know, some of you, any of you family members who've tried to see a GP recently, you know, you're lucky if you speak to the nurse and that'll be on the phone, and you're lucky then if you get a remote consultation with a doctor. The services are overwhelmed. You know, it's just the cutting edge of fire, firefighting to keep the chronic diseases a little bit under control. No one's really practicing the healing art. No one's really trying to get in and stop chronic disease developing. I set up a meeting of, uh, who happened to be a friend who was medical director of one of the local tra the, well, the teaching hospital in Southampton, who's become the chair of the ICS and now the ICB. Anyway, I set up a meeting to, for them to talk to the different PCN leads, the primary care network leads, the CDs. And they were talking about, well, what's this? Where's, where's the population medicine going to be medicine, uh, primary care? And the doctors were saying, how do we get funding for this and how do we get funding for that? And he said, uh, he was asked a question about what's the biggest impact that we can have, or you, you want to have in the new structure of the ICS. And he said, we'll improve air quality. Now, most GPs just can't get on that level. <laughs> you know, most doctors aren't thinking about that level. And there's a huge gulf in between of things that we can do for patients with those early warning signs of illness. So why is change so difficult? Why are we finding it hard to adapt? What's the resistance to change? So quite a few years ago, we used to run in Wessex um, uh, introductory days. And my father, who was a GP in Southsea, came to it. That was brave of him, really. <laughs> brave of me to invite him. <laughs> so he listened to it, and he was obviously quite pleased that I was sort of making a living at it. And <laughs> That was his main concern. And I asked him how it went. And he said, great that you're enjoying your work. I found the talk. It's all very interesting. But if I accept what you're saying, it means everything I've done up until now is wrong. You know, that resistance to change is hard. And in medicine, it's really hard, because we don't do failure. Or the consequence of failure are very high, and we hide them, as the recent maternity report re you know, released shows. You know, people find it hard to talk about failure. We do need to be able to try things out. We need to be able to try out different ways of working as a faculty, as a profession. So I sum that up as medicine progresses one retirement at a time. 
as I step aside, what ideas can move forward. <laughs> so the conservatism in medicine is, makes it tight, you know, makes it hard to break into it, hard to have a dialogue with it. It's a well-described feature, what's called organisational resistance. You know, I've been there, I've been in Gary's position as president trying to introduce change. It's very, very hard. You're a difficult group. And because it's not just conventional doctors, it's the tighter your beliefs and the tighter you are as a group, the more hold you, are, you hold to uh, the sort of history, your legacy. And it is, you know, it's great. We can build on this. This is a firm foundation. It's a road, but it's a road that you have to walk along. <laughs> It's not a road you can stand still in. So I mentioned about structure and function and sensation. And I think what I would put up there, from my experience, alongside the laws of cure, which are fundamental truths about the healing direction, the healing journey, which work across the board and aren't ours only. They're the right of all health professionals and all those who have an interest in helping others is that if you, you must listen at the realm of sensation, that's often when illness shows itself first. A pain, a feeling. And it flows into, or if it's, it becomes dysfunctional, can't flow. It goes into a disturbance of function or physiology. And that, if it can't flow. And that, when it can't flow, it's like the uh, paradoxes that we see in our case-taking and when we talk to patients. Or the sensation method would describe it as different mannerisms or movements that people have. Or it's the, you know, someone talking about something that's very sad but with a smile in their face or a slight laugh. Or they're talking about a difficult relationship and they're holding their throat about what they can't say in that case. And it's those clues that we pick up, or I pick up, they steer and navigate my consultation to allow it to drop to the next level. So we see the flow, if you like, the creative flow, the vital force, if you like, we call it, but you could call it chi, bounce, zip, whatever you like. The flows from the sensation, function, and structure. As it gets more grounded, the pathology gets more serious, more limited, limits the person's ability. That's why when we ask patients, you know, what's the greatest limitation to your life? What, what's the hierarchy of the symptoms that you're suffering, the diseases you're suffering? And the healing journey is a reverse of that. We know that. So what are the paradoxes that we see in our world organisationally? Because you'll know, again, those of you who heard me talk before about the five realms will know that I see a direct parallel between the illness, the patient, the people who are working with the patient, the doctors, the supervisors or teams they're working with in the wider context of organisations. It's sort of like a, these Russian dolls. Are we allowed to use Russian? <laughs> How the world changes. So yes, I do ponder. Am I an early adopter or a late changer? <laughs> what are you? Are we resistant to change? Are we struggling to embrace and pilot new ideas? Or are we on the cusp of trying and everything new is wonderful? And it's a difficult tension to hold. One of the things that I'm sure is going to happen, is happening already, is deprescribing. You know, we know those patients coming in with multiple prescriptions. You have the idea that every illness needs a different drug, and then a different drug for the side effects of the drugs. And we try and help those patients. We try and unpick them and create a hierarchy, and we try and see the one illness that underlies, or the one susceptibility that lies all those different symptoms, particularly in the elderly. And we know we have to do something about it, but conventional medicine hasn't got a lot for it. You know, Strangely, as I say to patients, the drug companies do a lot of research about when to start the drugs, but not a lot about when to stop them. <laughs> and that isn't to say they're wrong. I mean, I sometimes describe myself as a barbiturate student. <laughs> Nothing sinister about it. But I was convinced, I was told, you know, the barbiturates were the drug of choice, you know, for anxiety, sleeping problems first five years of my practice, ten years, you know, one of the regular patients that would come in would be trying to come off them. And then, of course, we move on to the benzodiazepines, <laughs> the new wonder drug. 
as one patent expires, the new drugs arrive on the scene. Isn't it amazing how that coincidentally happens? And then move from the benzodiazepines, you know, another decade, 15 years, trying to help people break the habit of those, the sleep that they block, and we know, and the dreams that they block, sorry, the sleep that they help, but they drop, disrupt this dream sleep. Dreams are essential, you know, for the psychological, our psychological well-being, the expression of our unconscious. It's why we ask about them in the interior medic in, the, in our repertorization. Fantastic information if they're not disturbed. But when you block them in people, it's really traumatic. I had someone who'd been on barbiturates and then benzodiazepines, and we took a long history. It took about five consultations, quite a few remedies. And he then relived in a consultation how during the war he had to kill someone with his bare hands. And he realized he could not face that memory. And what we do in a consultation, and what I do in a consultation, is I sit alongside. Not everyone likes the language, but they tr we travel on each other's aura. Or well, they travel on my aura. I take them back, and they re-experience that past event in a different way. They can move to a different place with that memory. I know it sort of feels like sort of psychobabble and psychotherapy, and there is a bit of that, but the mind is an important part of every physical condition. And I think we might, as a community, have missed some of that. Or I found that I was missing some of that in my early training. And I found it really helpful to think about remedies in that more psychodynamic way, the doors they open. And the benzodiazepines, SSRIs, and then the research showing we've got to take people off that. So you know, de-prescribing, moving people away from these harmful drugs when we can find an alternative. But what are the gentle routes? What are the ways of unpicking that and supporting patients in terms of their over-dependence on pharmacology? You know, conventional medicine has become synonymous to, to drug prescribing. It didn't used to be that way. And I'm not saying it's wrong. I'm not saying it's wrong to ever use those. When I was talking to, um, I, I, talk, I do some work with the GP trainers in, uh, in Wessex, and on the back of that, I talked to the trainees down there. And one of the trainees was saying to me, um, so why are you doing what you're doing? And I thought, I'd, oh, it's a good question. <laughs> I sort of got used to it. It's good. And then I thought, well, actually, I believe this is the future of medicine. You know, it's not the future for everyone, but it has a future. It has a place. And then, of course, I couldn't add, resist adding at the end, well, of course, conventional medicine could be a useful alternative. <laughs> So uh, patients have the journey into illness, and our job to coach, to sit alongside them, to use our tools of the trade, our understanding of the materia medica as a journey. I think I did, it, homeopathy, the community did me no favors thinking it was a magic bullet, <laughs> that one remedy would do it. I, I know there's some great prescribers, I'm not sure I can see many in the room, a couple actually, but certainly online there'll be a few of you. <laughs> the master and mistresses of the remedies, you know, the one prescription, all you need. I think I suffered from that. Um, yeah. Anyway, it made me stronger in the long hand. But it's a journey, you know, and you use the medicines to help you in that journey, or whatever tools you have. And again, I'm, not, I'm appealing here for really, I guess, the art of medicine for which I find homeopathy so invaluable. When we ran HPTG, and there's some students here, or ex-students here, sorry, who, who, uh, who, who, who remember those teachings that we did, you know, we had a vibrant course, and, uh, and not many stayed in homeopathy. I mean, it's lovely that there's still there's a few here. But one of the, uh, one of the students who was there um, gave some feedback, which I've always remembered. He said, I don't think I'm going to become a homeopath, but I've started, started to enjoy seeing patients again. <laughs> You know, you can listen to a consultation in a different way. It, there's other ways of doing that, but that need, you know, that, that journey, you know, like illness is a journey, our professional careers are a journey. And to think it's all summed up now in one state is a mistake. I used to teach at the medical school, and uh, Trish has taken that over now, but um, I used to start by saying to them, so 40 years ago, how much of medicine now is the same as 40 years ago? And they'd go, oh, well, it's, you know, it's quite different, isn't it? And the drugs are different. And, and I'd say, yeah, I mean, when I was training, um, the most common procedure in the gastro unit would be uh, doing vagotomies and partial gastrectomies. Or crippling rheumatoid arthritis would clog up the uh, outpatients in rheumatology. So 
So let's say about 20%. That would be the average. We used to get, use those little pointers and score things. And then I'd say, in 40 years' time, how much of commensal measurement would be the same? <laughs> and they say, oh, about 70%, 80%. Why will it be the same? <laughs> And in that change, there's an opportunity, in that evolution. So I think, you know, I think it's time for us to perhaps move away, and, and for me, it's talking to myself here, you know, my uh, falling into homeopathy, the organ on finding me, <laughs> was, was a way of uh, escaping, stepping away from conventional medicine. And I, I, I played that part of thinking, it's them and us. We're 100% right, they're 100% wrong. All they do is suppress things. And actually, I've moved. I have moved. You know, it doesn't have to be like that. It has its place for some structural stuff, for some patients, and it's patient's choice. That may be where they're at. What I do have an issue with is those, those, those patients who have those illnesses that often in general practice and secondary care, they're called, oh, they're just the worried well. <laughs> hypochondriacs. No, they're getting the recurrent acutes. Their life is impeded. Their energy creative force isn't flowing. They're the ones that will get ill. You know, we still haven't touched on. You know, I did a talk on uh, COVID and compared the mortality to chronic heart disease. And, acute, and, it's, and you know, COVID doesn't touch it. Cancer. I had a patient the other day who said, we could have a dinner party with 20 people and they'll all have had cancer. And she was in her late 50s. You know, those what we would call hidden, one-sided diseases that are hidden and one-sided because the pathology is socialised. It's all around us. That's the message we have to get across, is how do we work with and start to touch those themes? Because I think, and again, my suspicion is, I'll probably be drop down with something on the way home. But the suspicion is that when you work with those patients over a lifetime, you know, and that group of patients that become you know, homeopathic patients and can use it effectively, or whatever therapy it is that allows their vitality to pick up, it could be acupuncture, is really important that we work with those, that that's the opportunity. And then I take it a little bit further. So recovery isn't just about going back to where you were. Because that's where you got ill. <laughs> recovery is about going to a new place, a form of discovery. Gosh, time has flown by. What do I miss out on? Um, I wanted to mention veterinary surgeons, and uh, Peter, you're here, and. Uh, as a representative of all the different professional groups, it's great to hear different people using therapies, but, you know, our veterinary surgeons and their approach to health and well-being, what a vital voice that is in the understanding about the use of antibiotics in animal husbandry, the terrible state of animal husbandry and, and the way animals are treated, you know, the possibility of contributing to the onset of COVID from the CJD, or, you know, those illnesses, let alone the basic sort of feeling of how those animals are treated. You know, we need that professional group to champion the holistic health aspects of the wider sentient population. I was going to say a bit about death, but maybe I've been saved that. <laughs> but just, I, I, I do see patients who are dying, and they don't get a great service. You know, we are very frightened of death. And how can we find and build on our relationship with our patients to have an honest conversation about quality of life and when it is time to let go? Because that needs to happen. And I think we've got something to say around that. And so that brings me, I suppose, to my greatest wish for the health profession. And here I speak as a health professional, not as a homeopath. And that is that every health professional should have career-long supervision and support. You should see someone regularly. There should be someone at your back. Any of you can phone me up if you have a problem with a patient. Or with homeopathy. I've got your back. 
We need to have each other's back. Because when you have that, you have a perspective, a place to reflect from. You have to use a different system. You know, there's multiple, isn't there, different methodologies. But at the end of the day, these are universal truths, universal pain and suffering that we sit with, and we sit alongside our patients to suffer. And we need to be there for each other to do that. I wanted to just mention briefly the difference. Conventional medicine, as it is at the moment, focuses on fitness. The ability to perform in a given environment the optimum behaviour, optimum output. Health, which we deal with, is slightly different. There's an overlap, of course, but health is about not only dealing with the situation you're in now, but the situations that are coming your way or coming our way. It has a broader remit. We've all seen patients, I've seen many of them, who are very elite athletes who don't want to take conventional drugs and they want to use natural remedies. They're often not very healthy. <laughs> they may be very fit. And the extension of that is beauty. So beauty is really what you, how you look like so someone else can imagine how you behave in a certain way. <laughs> and medicine is confused about its priorities. There's a place to argue about aligning health, beauty and fitness. Gosh, emotional intelligence. I was going to pick back up on, a, on the, the importance of emotional intelligence and really celebrate and state that my journey that homeopathy has given me and the understanding the materia medica, living materia medica, reading the provings and seeing a little bit of myself in each of them has given me an emotional language that I would never have otherwise had. And it's a vital tool, part of how I work. And I think we shy away from it a bit as a profession because we're worried about it being considered all in the head or all psychological. And that's not, it's a continuum. They can't be separated. So it's been a challenging time, it's been a wonderful time. And looking ahead to the future, I think you're going to have a similar sort of wonderful time. <laughs> I feel that there's an opportunity to bring together those different people who are pursuing the healing art. It's not exclusive to us. One of my sadnesses is the embryonic discussions we had with the medical hypnotists, the medical osteopaths, the British Society of Environmental and Nutritional Medicine didn't come to anything. Because I think we need economies of scale. We need to be bigger. It's a great to see you all, and there's maybe some more people out there, but this is too big, <laughs> too small, I mean. We need more people. We need more people doing this stuff, standing in our corner, at each other's backs. I think there's a big challenge here. The General Medical Council, the British Medical Association, and the medical indemnity companies have failed to provide a vision and understanding of the importance of medicine as an art. If they don't get the message, I think we need to step away from them. You know, I've been there at a personal level. They recognize what we do. They're kind and generous people. But organizationally, we've been held back too long by being wanted to be part of their club. And if they don't recognize the benefits that come, from balancing art and science and medicine. Not only do they not deserve us, we don't need them. <laughs> we need to break free. I know that's a tough one, and I can say that towards the end of my career, but I honestly believe that's going to be one of the tough choices. And we need to sit down with the General Medical Council and say, look, have you got our back? Are you interested in what we do? Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs>
Uh, thank you. I'd first say thank you for being quiet for during the talk. <laughs> <laughs> hey! I, I had to hold back because at the beginning you were speaking about walking on the road and, and the track, and you know, I thought that was great. And would you have any comments about the possibility of walking on the pavement <laughs> and, and whether that should be on the right side or the left side of the road? <laughs> Can you see the road, Andrew? <laughs> I can see it. I'm on it. And actually, I'm in the bloody middle of it. <laughs> and, you know, yeah, I, it's, it's really clear to me, you know, where I've come from and where I'm going. And, and that, you know, that doesn't mean there aren't crossroads and there's time when there's cars whipping down and I'm dodging and I'm thinking, what the heck am I doing here? There'd be a lot of easier places to be. But I can see the road. And that's all I want you to do is to see the road. And not, it doesn't go a long, necessarily a long way in the future, but it's three or four steps at least. <laughs> and if you're lucky, it's half a mile. And if you're very lucky, there's a bright sunset at the end. <laughs> Marlies. Hi. Um, so I have so many questions, but I'll try and keep <laughs> it just to two. Um, so the first thing is you mentioned about patient choice. Yeah. And my immediate thought was pa patients can only have choice i.e. allopathic medicine, homeopathic yeah. medicine acupuncture, so on if they know what is out sure. there sure. and obviously in the western world we don't bring our kids up and um, our population to understand that so it's difficult to have choice when you don't know what homeopathy is. Sure, and, but that's part of our responsibility and our partners like the BHA, their responsibility is to do that education. So there's four groups of patients. They're lifelong homeopathic patients who come and see me and they become the homeopathic families and they sometimes more move that way. And sometimes the hardest thing with them is telling them actually you need a conventional drug now or if I was you then I'd take the conventional and then there's those who have, if you like, the chronic disease and they have multiple chronic diseases and nothing much is working or they've got terrible side effects. And those are the ones that I suppose we try and consolidate, help them with. Sometimes too much damage has been done. And then there's the recurrent acutes and the things that happen uh, where there's early warning of something and someone wants us just a higher sense of well-being. You know, what's our vitality in this room? I'd give you about seven or eight out of ten. You know, we need to get a wider appreciation of what is the vitality and what's the importance of that. It's rather been shamed on the back of miasms and humours, and we've moved to it's all about the intervention. So, look, that pop. And the last group of those people, you know, the young people who are coming in saying, look, I really want to try this, I want to do something as an alternative first. If you like, we're the alternative doctor, partly because they can't get to the GP, partly because they want to try us first or they want to bring their child to us first. So it's those different four marketing groups and we need to have a strategy for each of them. My other question, if, if I can, um, and it might be somewhat controversial to say we have got a huge group of homeopaths. They're called the Society of Homeopaths. And I know that, you know... So most moment, of them that I know are... Comp uh, see, uh, are not very busy. You know, there are a few that are busy, but, you know, you know how busy we can be in our practice. You know, so for me, a sort of average day is sort of, you know, a, a half day is a new patient and I suppose eight follow-ups. It's still a fraction of what people are seeing in general practice. But, you know, we need to be seeing more patients. And to do that, you need to build your capacity. And to build your capacity, you need supervision. <laughs> you need a space to, empty, to wring the sponge out. You know, it's energetic work. We go there, we allow people to travel to their places of pain. You know, that is the fundamental of passion of suffering. You know, and to sit with compassion, we have to be fresh and able to do that. And I think that most professional homeopaths and doctor homeopaths don't have enough time and enough capacity. It's not about just about advertising, just about getting the right pricing structure, just because it's in the NHS or not. It's about actually being able to welcome those people in. But we should really be speaking as one voice, should we not? We're such a small profession. There is one set of values. So again, I used to do values work quite a lot with different professional groups. And you start asking, what's the different values between a good nurse and a good doctor? Or what's the different values between a professional homeopath and a medical? When I was working and trying to bring those two together, 
the medical professional community didn't want to go and do that journey. The lay or professional homeopathic community didn't want to do that journey, to actually have a dialogue, a grown-up dialogue, about what is the requirements you have to explain to patients about the context in which you're giving it, the bounds of competence that we have to know very clearly if we're managing patients' health. So that conversation is still unfolding, I think. There's huge, huge discussions we can have there. Um, Sarah, Sarah Eames. Okay, thanks, thanks, David. A great, great talk. Thank you, sir. Um, I just wanted really to add my endorsement to absolutely everything that you said. <laughs> I've always been a creep, haven't I? <laughs> Sarah, next time you write it and I'll <laughs> <laughs> endorse you. <laughs> no, but I just, I, I suppose I've had more time, more time to think and yeah. observe really over the last year or so since I haven't been working for the NHS and things. Yeah. And it's really clear to me that we do need to change and we also need to be really brave you know, this is actually a time for being really brave. And I think you were alluding to that, weren't you, in a, a lot yeah. of what you were saying. This is, is such a critical time, I think, for healthcare and for personal choice in healthcare, not just in the UK, but in the whole world. And people need us like they've never needed us before. But as you said, if they don't know we're there, then that's a bit tricky. So I think the challenge is really now to probably form those links with people that will help us to be heard and offer real choice and real personalized, individualized time, healing, compassion for individual, sure. individual people. Because the health service is not going that way. It's As going in, so far the other way. I absolutely agree with you, Sarah. I think what we can do, and what I was trying to describe earlier, is that sort of... Um, it's too easy to other the other side. Mm. There's us and them. And if we hold that position, they hold yeah. that position, and it becomes reinforced. So I don't know what that balance is and that dance is, because yeah. on the one hand, I say, look, move away if they're really not going to shift. The other is, actually, we're not so different. You know, we are like all the pictures and all the humans that we see. You know, that they're not that huge difference. And when you talk to them individually, they're approachable, they're nice people, they're compassionate, they want to do well. But they've just been rather sold on science is all. <laughs> yeah, it's a challenge, but I just think we need to yeah, no, be, be brave, carry on thinking and support each other. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. Uh, yeah. David, just want to thank you because... Uh, feel as though <laughs> you and I have been on this journey for about 40 years. Sure, Tony. And, and yeah. I, so much of what you said just resonated, and, um, and, and, and the, the words that went through my head were as a sort of the essence of it, is yeah. the patient's journey is you can't change anything you don't accept. Sure. Uh, and that, that, to me, was the, sure. the outcome. And I think that I was going to say, if there had been time about pharmacy, so Tony's a, 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 one of our homeopathic pharmacists along with Lee, is, you know, it used to be true that 10% of, 10, 10, 10 of prescriptions were medically prescribed compared to 90% over-the-counter. It's probably even more. But you know, the over-the-counter market, we tend to sort of forget you know, the, the, the self-help that people do. You know, we, we tend to forget as, as health professionals that often, or as doctors, that we're only a small part. You know, we're one little voice in their overall matrix of health and well-being. So I really think, you know, pushing it out through the pharmacies and the wider professional groups. You know, everyone should know about it. These aren't sort of secret things that you're going to damage people with, but they're perceptions which are really important that we enable, enable other, the wider health community to develop. And I know you and Lee have done a lot, and uh, John has done a lot you know, in terms of promoting that uh, vision at a wider... Because those chronic diseases start because the acute things aren't being... Med you know, they're being suppressed. You know, we know the overuse of antibiotics. We know that if you use too many anti-inflammatories, the joint disease progresses more quickly. So what are the alternatives that we give people when those little niggles come up? What are the alternatives to aspirin and calpon that we can use? And, you know, you know we've got answers to that. Mm -hmm. Brian? Uh, David, I knew you 40 years ago, as you kindly mentioned, and I knew that you had a holistic vision then when I met you at Heinemann House. 
and it was open and you were ready to learn. You were straight out of your house job. And now it's been such a pleasure to hear you here of all places, the Royal Society of Chemistry, right around the corner from the Royal Academy. You talk about the science and art of medicine. Perfect. You, and for you to reassert what I heard here was a reassertion of the holistic principle, the holistic philosophy, a perennial philosophy of which we are part of in homeopathy. And we, at the, we are in a strong state. We have a, a patron of homeopathy as a future king of this country. Um, we, have, we have powerful people that support us still. And we, have, we know internationally homeopathy is, is still huge in places like India. And so what I'd ask you is, how can we, how can we get closer to the other forms of holistic medicine? And have we been hurt? I sometimes feel that we've been jettisoned a little bit by the other holistic people because of the tarnishing of our name through the various things that happened in homeopathy and the various forces of determinism, mechanism, and naive realism that have damaged us. Have we been left behind a bit, or do they still want to do business with us? <laughs> I think they will still do business with us. The, the, you know, what the game you play is, you know, the more holistic people are, the more special they want to be. And it's, <laughs> I'm a bit more holistic than you. <laughs> and each have their sort of territorial claims on that. Um, I think it's around getting, developing a common language. It's around getting the people in the room and at a human level connecting, I think, with them. But I, I think they want to do business with us. And, and we have a tradition, we have longevity in terms of our um, organisational structure. You know, we, you know, a lot of those groups don't have an AGM. They don't have a charitable foundation that's prepared to su support the, the aims and objectives of, uh, that we largely uh, align with. Um, so I think there are, we definitely have strengths, but I think we do have to sort of modernise and upgrade to some extent. So I was going to say that I'm a great privilege to be a homeopath. A homeopath taught me a lot of important tools, but I want to first and foremost be a craftsman, an artist. Now, homeopathy is like it, it, one of the tools in my toolbox, but I don't call myself a sawer or a chiseler, you know, or a driller. I use that tool as one of the tools. And I think it's, that's the problem, I think, is it's sort of, it's an important tool, it's very versatile, and it may be the one I use more than anything else, but it is one tool in the toolbox, and I think we need to find that, accept that there are other tools in those toolbox. And we talked about the vitality. I don't find finding a homeopathic remedy that touches people's vitality very hard. Actually, it's, you know, Hanneman had, what, 28 different remedies? You know, there was, you know, there was sort of 200 or so that we used to use, 40 polycrests. You know, now we've got more and more remedies to touch people and see them in so many more different ways. It's the obstacle to cure. It's the diet, it's the psychological beliefs, it's the lifestyle that people are leading that they really need coaching through. Once you get those out of the way, I mean, people self-heal. Animals have been doing it for millennia, humans have. You know, that's the paradox, is people will get better if you just stop the illness getting worse. <laughs> it's not rocket science. <laughs> and Brian, uh, Brian's a comedian. Humour, I think we can use humour. Yeah. And, and it is slightly provocative, but it is one way of getting our message across, and you do a great job at it. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> So I think we've got a question from Russell, Malcolm, and then you, Brad Sharma, and then we might need to bring things to a conclusion after that. Russell. David, it sounds as, as though your journey started with personal receptiveness to an idea or a, a set of expressions from Hanneman himself through the Organon. And I wonder whether or not communally we have been a bit too missionary in our attempts to communicate what it is we're about. Is there a way, or is there something, or do you have a, an instinct about how you engender the kind of receptiveness that you experienced, which seems to be absolutely essential to picking up the first thread? Is there something that we as a community can do to engender receptiveness rather than try and be missionary with what we do? Right. It's interesting you say about missionary, because the missionary school of homeopathy used to be based in the same buildings we did the long course in, and it was a great, they trained up missionaries to go out and do sort of barefoot doctoring, and, you know, actually, I was going to say, you know, was in terms of the way the environment's going, you know, one directory is actually, there's a large section of this world's population might have real problems accessing Western expensive medicine, and that quick over-the-counter 
first aid kit type remedies might really come back into their own. So I, so I think for me that what it's saying to me, I don't have an answer. I think, I think our personal journey, our personal evangelicism about, you know, like treating like or ultra high dilutions or, you know, those disagreements about high and low potencies or complexes or simple, you know, one of my patients came in and said, I saw a complex homeopath and they said if I came to see you, you, you were a simple homeopath. <laughs> So that sort of tension that we've created, I just don't think we need it. I think we sort of keep that, we should contain that within. And, you know, on this road, it's like, I'm about healing. I'm about integration. I'm about the holistic journey. I'm about taking you with me. I'm about, you know, helping you help yourself. I think that's the language that, for me, has helped me build my practice. And if it can extrapolate into the future and into other people's practice, and, you know, I guess that's what I'd say is try. But I suppose the other thing is, the great thing about new people coming in is, you know, getting to a qualification is about getting everyone to the same language, speaking a basic language. And, and we do that not badly in terms of remedies and concepts. But actually from there on, it's about how to, we can be different. How can we be a better one of these or a different one of these? And actually, I'm not sure we always welcome that diversity. You know, the great difficulty is people join for a time and then they leave and go off and do, join somewhere different or don't join anywhere and they go off on their own and practice. We need to somehow have that broader inclusion of that diversity. <laughs> if you want, Andrew. <laughs> Hi, Dave, thanks. Hello there. Great talk. Uh, I just wanted to ask, I mean, I know we've got limited resources. We're working on all kinds of things, membership, <coughs> patients, registration, teaching. But maybe one thing, if you've got an opinion on this, what we aren't doing, maybe any organisation isn't doing, for no gain whatsoever, not trying to get any patients, just talking to the public, public promotion, sharing knowledge in some way, which now we can do through social media. Yeah. And perhaps no one is actually talking to general, ordinary people about health. Yeah. I, th I think that's the difficulty with the sort of brand that you know, people sort of people close off when you talk about homeopathy. I think if you talk about the healing arts, you talk about helping people help themselves, you talk about people's healing journey. I think people get that sort of language, and then I think the next level is the tools that you use to do it. Um, and yeah, not everyone. You know, it's not always been a very welcome audience. You know, I've had my you know. I was going to say my fingers burnt or my soul hurt. You know, I, I mean, I've been in those difficult places and those difficult conversations and, and, and humiliated and shamed. And it's, you know, part of my... That's one of the wounds, you know. Oh, a slight snuggle behind your back and dismissal to the corner of the room because you're a homeopath, you know. And it's taken courage to do what Trish does, to stand up as a responsible officer in the GMC and say, mm -hmm. I represent this community. Uh, and we have done some of that outreach because we do also represent other doctors who aren't just homeopaths. So I suppose, you know, if this gives you a little bit of impetus and belief and, and wish to go and share your story, do. You know, because we're, we're, we're storytellers and we help patients tell their stories. And how we enable people to tell that story, I think, is probably what we need to do. Thank you, David. Uh, I think we'll, uh, we need to leave the, leave the questions there. There's a, some lovely comments online about people saying, uh, thank you, David. Your last message was hugely powerful. Uh, it's Gabby and, and others right. expressing their appreciation right. online. So thank you very much. And I would thank just you. like to express our appreciation here. We've got a small gift on behalf of the faculty, um, just to thank you for, <laughs> for all the stress. Oh. <laughs> Thank you, David. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.